very own Pastor Donna Battle all the way from North Carolina. Amen. Hey. I guess red means go too. That wants to that wants to delve in today. And so I am thankful for the presence of my family, for everybody who is here. Please know that my, my heart abounds with love for each of you as our God loves us in a precious, precious way. Let's center ourselves for prayer here from God. Minister Lauren invited us at the beginning of worship to breathe. And so just take a breath and let God rest in you. Let God consume anything that's on your mind that needs to be out of the way. Feel God take those things into God's self. That our ears may become keen to the sound of God's voice. That our spirits may attune to the word that is right for us both individually and collectively. Almighty God, we trust that you will do in us what is necessary and what is needed. And that we don't need to name that or always know what that is, but in this moment, we bring to your altar trust. Speak that we might hear, impart that we might receive that we might be healed, that we might transcend, that we may be who you created us to be, your beloved. So it is and so it shall be in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen. Are we being esau Are we being esau So I, I'm asking for your a bit of grace at the front end of this because we're going to read quite a bit of scripture. All right, so just stick with us, stick with us all right? All right, settle into your seat just a little bit. <laughs> As we uh, take a look at the story of Esau, we'll read first. We're going to skip around in Genesis a little bit because his story is kind of spread out. And so we're going to start with Genesis 25, verses 21 through 23. And that reads as follows. Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his prayer and his wife, Rebecca, conceived. The children struggled together within her and she said, if it is to be this way, why do I live? So she went to inquire of the Lord and the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb and two peoples born of you shall be divided. One shall be stronger than the other. The elder shall serve the younger. Then if we go down to Genesis 25, 29 through 34, we read, Once when Jacob was cooking a stew, Esau came in from the field and he was famished. Esau said to Jacob, Let me eat some of that red stuff, for I am famished. Therefore he was called Edom, which means red. Jacob said, first sell me your birthright. And Esau said, I am about to die, for what use is a birthright to me? And Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. When Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew and he ate and drank, he rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. We skip now to Genesis 27, verses 34 through 41, reads as follows. When Esau heard his father's words, he cried out with an exceedingly great and bitter cry. And he said to his father, bless me also, father. But he said, your brother came deceitfully and he has taken away your blessing. Esau said, is he not rightly named Jacob? For he has supplanted me all these two times. He took away my birthright, and look, now he has taken away my blessing. 
Then he says, have you not reserved a blessing for me? Isaac answered Esau, I have already made him your Lord. And I have given him all his brothers as servants, and with grain and wine I have sustained him. What then can I do for you, my son? Esau said to his father, Have you only one blessing, father? Bless me also, father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. Then his father Isaac answered him, See, away from the fatness of the earth shall your home be and away from the dew of heaven on high. By your sword you shall live and you shall serve your brother. But when you break loose, you shall break his yoke from your neck. Now Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father had blessed him. And Esau said to himself, the days of mourning of my father are approaching, then I will kill my brother Jacob final portion of scripture Genesis 33 the first 11 verses read as follows now Jacob looked up and saw Esau coming and 400 men with him so he divided the children among Leah and Rachel and the two maids he put the maids with their children in front then Leah with her children and Rachel and Joseph last of all he himself went on ahead of them bowing himself to the ground seven times until he came near his brother. But Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him and they wept. And when Esau looked up and saw the women and children, he says, who are these with you? And Jacob says, the children whom God has graciously given your servant. Then the maids and the children drew near and they bowed down. Leah likewise and her children drew near and bowed down. And finally, Joseph and Rachel drew near and they bowed down. Esau says, what do you mean by all this company that I met? And Jacob answered, to find favor with my Lord. But Esau says, I have enough, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. And Jacob says, no, please, if, you find, if I find favor with you, then accept my present from my hand, for truly I see your face is like seeing the face of God. Since you have received me with such favor, please accept my gift that is brought to you because God has dealt graciously with me and because I have everything I want. So he urged him and he took it. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. This sermon today is a product of two conversations I have had with my sister and our dear friend, Minister Adrian Philpart. At the close of one of our regularly scheduled times to talk, we were talking about the state of our lives and our people. And she said something to me at the end of our call that stuck with me. She says, you know, with everything that's going on and with all the ways that we are holding the things that we're holding, the things that are happening, she says, I have got to wonder, are we being esau As in, are we having a similar experience to that of Esau? And I couldn't let that thing go. <laughs> As it sat with me, and as it toiled with me. And so we came back for a subsequent conversation and after we talked at length about Esau and Esau's story, she says to me, I think you gotta preach this. And I said, yeah, but that's gonna be a while. She says, okay. That was Monday. I did not know she was praying since Monday that God would impart this word in me swiftly for the now. And so I give her credit because there are parts of this sermon that have come from the wellspring of who she is and how God operates in who she is. I honor her in this sermon and in our conversation with this text today. And I say, be on the lookout just in case she decides to expound upon this work in her writing. 
about 14 years ago, I sat in my first clergy organizing training. And the organizer who was teaching this training told a story of a pastor who had recently been kind of newly appointed to his church, wanted to get the church involved in organizing and was trying to develop what is known as a core team, which is akin to like a justice ministry, right? The team that would hold this part of the work for the church. And he was struggling because he had started setting up one-to-ones with folk he thought would be good for the core team. And in every situation, they continued to name one person. They continued to name an elder woman in the congregation over and over and over again. Somehow, every time he did a one-to-one, she would come up. And so the pastor finally decides to go and meet with her. When he sits with her, he realizes that she holds the historical and the contextual memory of not just the church, but the wider community. That she had become somewhat of a barometer for folk in the church of what was right. And oftentimes, before people would decide where they landed on a stance with something, they would look to see where she sat with it. She held a lot of influence. And he realized in his power analysis, which is a big deal in organizing, right? In his power analysis of the church that if he was going to build a core team that she need to understand what this thing was. And after he explains it to her, all of a sudden the core team within a matter of weeks began to form because she understood what he was trying to do and was able to invite the people she knew best suited to do this good and holistic work. But the pastor said this. He says, when I first came to this church, he says, when I saw her, all I saw was a little old lady sitting on the corner bench. He says, but what I saw was not what I was seeing. He says, what I was really seeing was a powerhouse of influence and change. Sometimes in life, family, what we see is not really what we are seeing. Esau has a brother, Jacob. They are twins, born to the son of Abraham, Isaac, and his wife, Rebekah. Jacob's name means trickster, and while they are warring within her belly, Rebecca actually seems to think perhaps her babies will not survive after a long time of barrenness. And when she seeks out God, God says to her, there are two nations in your womb. They are divided and will be divided. He says, but the stronger will serve the younger, right? Or one will be stronger than the other, and the elder will serve the younger. And so they grow. Esau becomes a hunter, a man of the field. He's a daddy's boy. Jacob, more akin to the finer things of life, and he is a mama's boy. Well, the story goes that one day, Esau is out in the field, presumably hunting or working, and Jacob is home cooking, and he is making a lentil stew. And when Esau comes in from the field, he is famished. And he comes to his brother, and he says, Brother, please, I am famished and tired. He says, Please give me some of your stew. Jacob, the trickster, seeing his opening, says, All right. You can get some of this stew, but you got to sell me your birthright first. You see, Esau and Jacob were twins, but Esau was born first and therefore held the status of elder. Esau says, what good is a birthright to me if I am about to die? And Jacob says, "Uh -uh uh-uh-uh, I need you to swear to it that I'm going to get your birthright for this bowl of stew. So Esau swears, and he sells his birthright for a bowl of stew, a piece of bread, and something to drink. 
And we're going to pause here for just a moment. Because you see, we could automatically, at the very start of this narrative, think we see what we don't. When I first read this, right? I don't think I've sat with this passage in over 18 years. When I first read this 18 years ago, I thought to myself, man, Esau is one dramatic somebody. You famished, you tired, you been hunting, you been working, you about to die now, dude. He should have took your birthright, right? <laughs> you all over the top. Ain't nobody that hungry. <laughs> you ain't that hungry, right? But when I came back 18 years later, I had to look at it a little differently. So several years ago, I was standing in line at an amusement park with a family friend, the heat of summer, waiting to get on a ride. And when I look back at her, her eyes have zoned out. And I'm like, well, where did she go, right? So I start to say her name just to see if she is you know, able to respond to me and she's having a hard time responding. Her knees began to buckle, right? And so she kept saying, I'm all right, I'm all right, but she's buckling and, and, she's, and she's zoned out. And I was like, no, 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 you're not all right. And I walk with her praying she does not collapse before we get to the shade. And she sits and we get food in her and drink in her and she has to rest and cool off, right? She wasn't from the South. She wasn't used to the humidity of the South. And she had not eaten for quite some time, not realizing that you gotta eat if you're gonna be in the heat, right? You don't wanna eat too much, you gotta eat. And you gotta drink. But had she stayed in the heat a little while longer, she really would have been in danger medically because she could have moved into what is known as heat stroke, which has been known to kill people. You see, when we go back to this passage and we look at the word that Esau uses, Esau uses the word famished, which means not just weary, but it means faint. It means that in this moment, Esau could have very well been experiencing heat exhaustion. He could have very well been at a place in his life where he felt like he was about to lose consciousness. That when he asked his brother for a bowl of stew, he is afraid that if he doesn't get something in his body, he might not survive. Hey, y'all, we are a people well accustomed to being asked to give up something or to, be, to give an unfair price when we are finding ourselves in a life-threatening situation. Are we being Esau? You see, the pain of this moment was that Jacob had so much of a disregard for his brother's life. In order to get what he wanted, that he was willing to let his brother experience a medical emergency rather than give him what he needed. And you see, it makes a whole lot more sense to me that he would actually sell his birthright if he felt in his body like something ain't right, like I might not survive this. Story goes that sometime later, their father, Isaac, is sick and blind. He is near death. And so Esau goes to him because though his birthright is no longer his, there is a blessing that goes along with the birthright for the elder. And so he goes and he says to his father, I want you to bless me. And his father says, yes, son, I'm going to bless you. But first I want you to go, go, go hunting for me and, and make my favorite meal. Just let me taste that food one more time. And so while Esau is out, Jacob and his mother, Rebekah, plot. And they steal the blessing by tricking Isaac, who is blind, into believing that Jacob is Esau. And so when Esau comes back and he and Isaac discover what has happened, you can imagine how horrible he feels. Now denied and or betrayed two times, not just by a brother, but a brother who is a twin. And also by his mother. And at a time when his daddy, who he is closest to in the family, is about to die. 
I don't know about you, but I'm sitting here and I'm reading this and I'm like, if I was Esau, I would feel like, oh my God, I feel like the whole world is against me. The one person in the family who gets me is about to be gone and the other two who should love me just keep hurting me over and over and over again. I declare y'all, it seems like every day we wake up, every day we read the news, every day we go to work, every day we talk to somebody in our family, it seems like no matter what we do, we can't win for losing. Are we being Esau? And so Esau says to his daddy, Isaac, he says, Daddy, please. He says, bless me too. Isaac's like, what do I have for you? I've already given the blessing away. He says, really, Daddy? You only got one blessing? Bless me too. I don't care what it is. Just give me a blessing. So his father does bless him. And Esau leaves there. He says, you know what? When I finish mourning the death of my daddy, Jacob is done. I got it. I got something for him. So much so that Rebecca is scared for Jacob's life and sends him away to live with her family. Esau then marries his cousin, Mahalath. And it is four chapters, y'all. Four chapters and many years later before Esau reemerges in this narrative. Jacob is about to meet Esau for the very first time, and Jacob is scared out of his mind. Years later, that his brother is going to take him out. Do you hear me? He is like, mm mm. And so, what does he do? He sends all these gifts ahead of him to try to appease his brother, right? I want to butter him up a little bit. He sends all these gifts ahead, and when he sees him coming with over 400 men with him, it scares him even more. And so what does he do? He takes his maids and the children he has with his maids, they're his kids, and he places them in the front. And he takes his wives, Leah and Rachel, and their kids, and he puts them in the back. I'm telling y'all, it is hard to read this account and like Jacob. You're like, dude, you are really still pretty jacked up. Right? The people you most value, you put in the back, but they still your kids you got on the front. Right? He is expecting to be met with vengeance, but instead, he is met with love. Esau does not wait for his brother to get to him, right? Jacob, in an act of humility, run, moving towards Esau, bowing ever so many steps, bowing ever so many steps. Esau runs and meets him, throws himself on him, engulfs him in a hug, puts his face into his neck, and they weep. And Esau says to him, he says, what is all of this that you have given to me that you sent ahead? He says, I have enough. He says, no, if you find favor with me, he says, if my Lord finds favor with me, that, like, I, I, I want you to keep it. He's like, no, 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 I'm good. Keep, keep your stuff. He says, no, 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 no. <laughs> he says, seeing your face and having your favor is like looking on the face of God. So Esau relents and receives reparation for the past injustices committed and hope for right relationship in the future. Now y'all, I must admit that the part of this narrative that I wanted to see the most is the part that is missing. Right? Yeah. I want to know how in the world Esau moved from being ready to kill his brother to running in tears to embrace him. Like, I want to know that part. And as I sat with that thing, I started to realize that, that perhaps maybe the part that was hidden was hidden for a reason. That perhaps somewhere along this line of, of healing, around this line of evolving emotionally and spiritually, which is what Esau did, that the process of that is actually wedded to the parts we must discover about ourselves that are hidden. 
Yeah. And that sometimes we want this cookie cutter, everybody do it the same way, give me the steps, one, two, three way of getting to a place, but all of us are so different that though there may be similarities in our healing process, all of us are different enough that if we saw Esau's process, we would be trying to follow it to the T and it might not fit who we are. And so when I finally accepted that what I thought I needed isn't what I needed, that what I thought I wanted to see isn't what I needed to see, then I was free to potentially see in the passage what was there to see. And that's where I want us to spend the remainder of our time today, sitting with Esau's story. That what I saw, what I believe I discovered, was a series of promises that we can cling to in our processes of healing and evolution emotionally and spiritually. That Esau's story yields promises that I believe do not shift. That are true for all of us, no matter how our process may vary, no matter what hidden parts of ourselves we need to find, there are things that anchor us. And I believe that's what we see. The first thing I think we see in Esau's story is that those who have gone before guide those who will come after. More specifically, those who have gone before and healed. I got to put that on there, Lauren. You know, right? It ain't, it's a whole lot of people that gone before, but if they ain't healed, I don't need you going after them. Okay, those who have gone before and healed are able to guide those who come after and are ready to heal. Right? So when I went back to the last thing that happened before we see Esau's transformation, the very last thing that happens in this narrative that is recorded, he marries Mahalath. He marries his cousin. And I think that that may have been a turning point in his story of healing and emotional and spiritual evolution. I once had a professor in um, seminary who shared this experience that he had in worship one Sunday. He says he was sitting in worship and a teenager of his congregation who was living with Down syndrome began to break down and wail in service. And she began to say over and over very loudly, I'm scared, I'm scared, I'm scared, I'm scared, I'm scared. And a person next to her tried to, you know, get her and guide her out of the sanctuary, but she resisted. She says, no, I'm scared, I'm scared. She says, I'm pregnant and I am scared. He says, an elder woman got up from her seat and began to walk towards her. And as she began to walk, other women began to stand up in the congregation and walk towards her and they surrounded her. She says, I'm scared, I'm scared. I don't know what to do, I don't know what to do. And the elder just very gently and kindly says, it's okay, baby, it's okay. She says, I've been there. She says, many of us have been there. She's like, we will help you figure out what it is you need to do. He says it was one of the most beautiful moments in a worship experience that he had ever had. He says it was memorable in a way, right? Even if her um, way out was different from theirs, right? It wasn't about them telling her what she should do. It was about them bearing witness that there is a way for this to get better. It was about them bearing witness that she was not alone in it. It was about bearing witness that she could be coached through this thing. Y'all. It was not uncommon for people to marry their cousins. We know that, okay? So don't get hung up on that. There is a bigger piece. It wasn't just any cousin that he married.
Esau married the daughter of Ishmael. Ishmael was the half-brother of Esau's father, Isaac, the son of Abraham. But perhaps more important than Ishmael is that Mahalath, Ishmael's daughter, was the granddaughter of a formerly enslaved black Egyptian woman who did not have the choice as to whether or not she birthed Abraham's child. She was a woman enslaved, scorned, mistreated, made to rely on her master and then put out, abandoned with her child, with no means of protecting him, with no means of providing for him. Mahalath, the woman who Esau married, was the granddaughter of Mother Hagar. Hagar, y'all, who was able to figure out how to thrive despite the fact that every single odd was against her. Don't tell me it was a coincidence that the last thing we see in this passage is him marrying the granddaughter of Hagar and then the next time we see him, this man is free. Don't tell me that's a coincidence. Yo! If anybody was going to understand what Esau had endured at the hands of the same family, it would be Ishmael and Hagar. If anybody was going to bear witness, hey, baby, I know it's bad. Hey, baby, I know your family shouldn't have done you like this. Hey, baby, I know it ain't fair. Hey, baby, I know this ain't what love's supposed to look like. But guess what? Look at us now. Those who have gone before and healed. God, those who come after and need to heal. Yo. If you are going to heal, you have got to find your people. Esau found his place of belonging. His daddy was gone. That was his person. He was alone. He says, no, I got to reconnect to my people. You've got to find your people, and you have got to be willing for them to see your pain. You've got to be willing for them to walk with you in your pain, not because they know more about you than you know about yourself, but because you need the constant witness that when it gets hard, there is still a way for this thing to get better. Those who have gone before guides those who come after. But the second thing we see, the second promise we must remember, is that the conventional will never usurp the divine. More specifically, conventional birthrights will never usurp divine birthrights. Minister Adrian, in our conversation, reminded me that what Esau gave up was a conventional birthright. It was not a divine birthright. And we're going to come back to that in a minute. But in North Carolina, we got several water parks. And at these water parks are, are these things called wave pools or wave simulators. Some of y'all might know about them things, right? They are in, intended to simulate the ocean, right? And they, you know, big old bodies of water. And don't get me wrong, any big body of water, natural or not, deserves some level of respect for what it can do, right? But these wave simulators have concrete or hard bottoms, right, floors, and they got timed waves. 
They ain't unpredictable like our ocean, right? They ain't beautiful and they're all like our oceans. They don't commune with the moon in a way that creates a high tide and a low tide. They don't have breathtakingly beautiful sunrises and sunsets. They don't inspire the wonder and the awe of so much power. So much so that my husband, Dedrick, actually um, holds this in a very particular way, right? We went to the beach not too long ago, and you know, I, I would go, I was always told, you don't go no further than your waist, <laughs> right? <laughs> you don't go into the ocean no further than your waist. Other people, way on out there, right? Mm, don't you do that. Dedrick, on the other hand, he don't go past his knees. <laughs> and I was like, hey, baby, I said, come on, come out, come out at least to the waist. He said, mm, he said, I don't mess with the ocean. <laughs> he said, I don't play with the ocean. And what was he saying? He was saying, I have a certain level of reverence and respect that the ocean demands I have for it, right? A certain level of respect for its capacity to both give life and take life. I don't care how great that wave simulator is, it will never compare to the power of standing on a beach looking at the ocean. The conventional will never usurp the divine. Minister Adrian says this was a conventional birthright. What did that mean? It meant that this was a birthright given by humanity, by the family of Esau and Jacob. Oftentimes these birthrights, just like now, are passed down to the eldest, often the eldest son. Right? Steeped in these conventional birthrights is automatically an air of scarcity. It says only one of you can get this. Right? Only one can get it. Not all of you, just one. Right? And it is based on the frivolity of which order you were born into the family in. It's frivolous, y'all. Advantage given simply because you happen to come out first. There are these limitations there. And now Esau, having given up this conventional birthright to his brother, goes to his father and he seems to know even if Esau don't know it. Like sometimes we know some stuff, y'all, and we ain't conscious of it, right? But something in our spirit, something in our body know it. Yeah. Something ain't right about this. Esau seems to know even if he's not conscious of it, something that his daddy doesn't even know. So when he gets there and this conventional birthright that usually comes with the blessing of the elder, right? That seems to also be conventional. When it comes to that blessing, and Jacob has now stolen both of these things, his daddy says, I don't have anything else to give you. I have given it all to Jacob. And Esau says, no, you haven't, daddy. Are you serious? You only got one blessing? And you see, this is what Isaac did not get. You see, sometimes in the convention of birthrights, in the convention of this world, in the convention of our families, we confuse what is conventional with what is divine. And let me tell you something about blessings, you all. Blessings are never conventional. Blessings are always divine. And you know why? Because they stem from a person's love for another. And where there is love, there is not scarcity. There is an abundance. So I don't care how many blessings you give out. I don't care how many blessings you have received. There is always more. Y'all, oh, ways more. And then we see when Isaac or Jacob and Esau re-meet. <laughs> and Esau says to his brother, why have you sent all this stuff? Why do you bring all these people? He says, because I want to find favor, right? 
It's the abundance that he wants, right? He wants to give his brother the abundance of what he has taken away. But what does Esau say? Esau says this, I have enough. Keep your stuff for yourself. And he didn't say it in a way that was like, I don't need your stuff. He was truly free, okay? He was free in a way that says, "Uh, uh, uh-uh-uh, I'm good, brother. What I thought I needed, I didn't need. That conventional birthright you got, I didn't need that to be happy. I didn't need that to have abundance because abundance is not bound by who gets to choose, who gets what, and who doesn't. He was saying, I have enough. Early philosopher Euripides says this. He says, enough is abundance to the wise. Enough is abundance to the wise. The blessing that Isaac gave to his son started off rough. He said to his son, he says, you're not going to live close to the fatness of the earth or the abundance of the earth. He not, you're not going to be close to the dew of heaven. He says, you're going to live by your sword and you're going to serve your brother. But y'all, then, but then Isaac says this. Isaac says, but when, not if, But when you break free, you shall lose the yoke. Shall you lose the yoke of your brother from your neck? (laughs) When we see Esau, we see this blessing that is divine. His divine birthright is at work. He has loosed his brother's yoke from his neck. He has not lived all these years within the burden of the evil of his brother's crimes. He had allowed himself to access joy. He had allowed himself to access peace. And in doing so, God had returned to him what he had lost the most, his respect. (laughs) The conventional never usurps the divine. When Jacob comes to his brother, he is scared out of his mind. He is stunted in his emotions and he is stunted in his fear. He is even stunted in his guilt because he finally realized he did some jacked up stuff even though he's still doing jacked up stuff. (laughs) He was bound y'all but Esau was free. Esau was free, and he had traded the scarcity of his family's birthright for the abundance of God's blessing. The conventional never usurps the divine. He got back what his vengeance and his anger never could have. Which takes us to our last point, and which brings us back to the beginning. The one who is centered in the narrative may not be the one the narrative is about. We must remember, y'all, the one who is centered in the narrative, which in this case is Jacob, may not be the one the narrative is about. We go back to the beginning. Genesis 25, when God speaks to Rebecca and God says to Rebecca, one shall be stronger than the other. Yeah. Isn't it interesting how God doesn't name any names? And when you read it, right, because the story seems to be centered around Jacob, we automatically think that that's about Jacob. But based upon what we now know, based upon the evolution we now see in Esau emotionally and spiritually, we now have evidence from the text that he actually was the stronger one. 
right? So at least that portion was probably about Esau. But then we have this second line that says, the elder shall serve the younger. And that's true. Esau comes out the elder and, you know, when Jacob usurps his, uh, his birthright, you know, he, you know, all the brothers, not just the brothers who were born to Rebecca, but who were born to Leah and all the maids, because there were all these other kids that are unnamed, right? It won't just the two of them in the house. All of them had to serve Jacob. So there is this like really on the face truth, but I think we have to remember you all. If you don't remember nothing else, always come back to what I think I am seeing may not be what I am seeing. Right? We see this show up in scriptures like be careful how you entertain strangers because you might just be entertaining a Joes, right? And I don't think it's a secret for those who know me well that I don't think we spend enough time really um, uh, working through or challenging our assumptions, right? That, that to challenge our assumptions is to actually enter into a space of humility. And there's this Sufi teacher who, so Sufism is the mystical arm of Islam, and there's this Sufi, Sufi teacher, Idris Shah, who says that, you know, it has been said and it is true that humility is not so much a virtue as much as it is a necessity in order to learn. That there are certain places, we thresholds, we can't cross over, y'all, until we enter not into false modesty and false humility, but in true, genuine humility. And I think that rests right here with us thinking we see what we don't. So we go to this second line, and this second line says, the elder shall serve the younger. But when we fast forward to this meeting where we see Esau's transformation, and when he asks, you know, what is all of this? And then um, Jacob says to him, he says, um, that I might find favor with my Lord. Lord here, you all, is little L. Not big L as in God. Jacob ain't talking about the Lord God. He says that I might find favor with my Lord. He is using the term usually used for the conventional head of the family. He is saying to Esau, I now come back under servitude to you. So this thing has come back around. His kids and his wives and his maids, what do they do? They bow to the head of the family. (laughs) So despite the fact that he had done all this work, to take from his brother what won't his, he ended up having to give it back willingly anyway. Wow. Right? And so we look at that, and then we look at what God says in, in um, Genesis 25, and we have to wonder, is what we are seeing here maybe not what we are seeing? When God says the elder will serve the younger, now in light of this, I see two possible avenues for what we have missed. One, is that God does not attach time to it. So when God says the elder will serve the younger, he doesn't say the elder will serve the younger forever. Nor does God not say, God does not say that the younger will never once again serve the elder. God simply says the elder will serve the younger. Hard stop. And so we now have this variation in this speaking of God for all of the possibilities that we see. But then there's a second avenue that I see that's possible. When Jacob stole his brother's birthright, he assumed the role of elder, which relegated Esau to the role of the younger. So by convention standards, Jacob was in fact the elder. And Esau was in fact the younger. Do you hear me? Do you hear me? That you are the one who is centered in the story might not be the one the story is about. That we can be denied the conventional advantages of this world, even of our families. We can be written out of the stories and the narratives, but guess what? You can't take us out of the story altogether. And when God speaks, we got to pay attention to that. When God speaks, it is God who says this to Rebecca. When God speaks, 
we are always centered. See, I don't believe that what God was saying was about Jacob at all. The stronger is Esau. The elder is served. And so God, once again, gives to him in his willingness to give up all the anger and all the hurt and all the pain gives to him what his vengeance could never have gotten him. And perhaps that's why God says vengeance is mine. Because you all, vengeance and justice are not the same. You see, justice is based and is birthed out of love. Justice comes from a place that says a wrong has happened and I want to right that wrong. It comes from a place that says I want people to heal. It says that I want people to no longer be harmed. Justice is our call. Justice is our work because it flows from a wellspring of love for things to be right and for people to be healed. Vengeance is birthed out of pain. It is the kind of pain that says I want people to hurt for the way they have hurt me. Right? One heals and the other hurts or harms. They are not the same. So when we give up our vengeance, when we give up our vengeance, what are we saying? We are saying that God, perhaps in my anger and in my pain, I'm not seeing as clearly as I think I do. We are saying in our humility, you know what, God? Maybe you do see better than me. Maybe you do know better than me. Maybe you are more capable than me. When we give up our vengeance, we are saying yes to emotional and spiritual evolution. For God had taken the ashes, the angry ashes of vengeance, and he had transformed them into the beauty of abundance. God had taken scarcity and given way more than he ever could have asked for. He was fine when he came to meet his brother, but he was even better when he left. God will take the yoke of bondage and betrayal, and God will trade it for freedom. So when Minister Adrian asks us, are we being Esau? I don't know about you but I certainly hope so. In the name of all that is good and right and just. Amen.